<laughs> OK, great. Well, welcome back. So the last lesson was promises. We went a little deeper into them. Remember that when I taught you the core uh, technologies, it was fetch and promises together. And then we dug a little deeper into promises. And now we're going to go a little deeper into fetch. And I need to get my clicker off the table here. Otherwise, I'm going to walk back and forth a whole lot today. So fetch is a modern replacement for XML HTTP request, which we all call XHR. Um, because XHR was written way back in the day. It was, it was basically written in 1993, roughly 95, for Microsoft to be able to build Microsoft Outlook as a web client. And then everybody else found it and started using it for interesting things. And so it's all based on callbacks and events. And there's just a lot of historical cruft. It hasn't quite kept up with the times. Um, it's been revised a couple of times, but the revisions never caught on widely which is what I really mean by saying it hadn't kept up. So instead, it was replaced with window.fetch. Um, so fetch handles things like redirect, a lot of common redirections. Sometimes you need to handle it, but very often fetch will handle it for you. It has built-in decoders for things like JSON and text and blobs. So that's something you don't have to write. Um, it's promise-based, which makes your code really clean. So you're not dealing with a bunch of callbacks. Um, it's used by the service workers, the cache API, all of that. So it's actually a standard in the system. It has standard request and response objects. It's kind of like we refactored the network stack, basically. And it handles cross-origin resource sharing. How many people have worked with cores before? Oh, sweet. OK. So a lot of the back row. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it for the rest of you. It's pretty straightforward. So let's, let's just do a quick JSON fetch. You saw an example of this yesterday. This should be pretty familiar. So we'll do a fetch of examples.json. We'll unpack the response. We'll pass it down to the next thing. Here's the catch that says the fetch failed. Great. <coughs> That's our standard example. Now, how do you handle errors? The suggested pattern for doing it is when you call fetch, you're going to get a value back. Even if you get a 404, it's not an error. You'll still get a result in fetch. You only get an error if there was an actual problem with the network, if there was an actual exception. So what you need to do is look at the response object. And if response OK is true, then you're fine. You're in the 200 range, and you've got the data. If response OK is not true, then you've got an error. In this case, we're just going to throw response status text. Probably should wrap that in an error. Um, so this is the standard pattern. Is as soon as you get the response, check for it and fail early by throwing the exception. And that would then fall down to the catch at the end. So let's grab some data. We're going to be on foo.com. So we're on one website. And we do a fetch across the network to a different website, bar.com. What happens? How many people think that it works? How many people think that it fails? How many people are not sure? A lot, there was actually a lot of no hands up on either one. So it, in fact, does fail. Because remember the rules of the single origin rules in the browser, which say that a page going and making a network request can only fetch data from the same origin. There's, there's some exceptions to that rule. But JSON is not one of the exceptions. So if I'm on foo.com and I want to go to bar.com, that's two different origins. That's a cross-origin request. And the browser actually will deny that by default. Now, what are the exceptions? The exceptions are if I'm fetching an image or a script. Um, those, have, those are exemptions on those. And so people often use that as a loophole to get JSON data by doing JSONP, which is to say you wrap the JSON in a function and return it as a script. And because scripts are exempt from single origin, you can do that. But that's really kind of a bad idea. You know, you're asking for a script from somewhere else and just expected to take it and run it. That's kind of like walking in somewhere blindfolded and saying, OK, feed me anything. Right? It's not the most secure way to go. And it's really, I mean, and it's a hack. So there's now a standardized way to work cross-origin. 
called cross-origin resource sharing, CORS. This has been in place for a little while. So the browser still enforces the single origin model. The browser still <coughs> you know, basically says, OK, same origin. Origin, by the way, together it's a scheme. So HTTP versus HTTPS are two origins because they're different schemes. The host name and the port. So if any of those change, it's a new origin. Um, as it says, the exceptions here are images, scripts, media content like video audio, um, and embedded objects. So if I go cross-origin for JSON, it fails, except if I have CORS support. <coughs> now, the browser has to support it, and the server has to support it, but it's a really easy protocol. And anybody writing a back-end application can add CORS support to their back-end with like, less than five lines of code. <coughs> so when the browser detects that you're doing a cross-origin request, the browser attaches an origin header to the request listing the original source origin. The server on the other end receives that, notices the origin header, and responds with access control allow origin. And it either copies the origin back as the value of this, or it returns an asterisk, a star. Star means I don't care, everybody can, come yeah, everybody can make cross-origin requests to me. The browser will see that header on the response and actually permit the request to go through. So that's how cross-origin resource sharing works. Very simple. So if you're writing a back end, you could either do access control allow origin for origins that you know are valid requesters for you. Um, but you can only return one origin at a time. So you would basically have a whitelist internally. Or if you really don't care, just put a star out there. If you have some data that you don't care if any browser can see it, just automatically attach access control allow origin star. You could set the custom header in your web server. So if there's no cores, if I ran fetch with a mode of no cores, then and if I ask for data.json, I still get a response. I still even get response OK. But the response is opaque, meaning when I go to read the data, uh, then I get an exception. Because <coughs> let's say I have a page with an iframe, and the iframe is from a different origin. So my outside application might make that cross-origin request, get the opaque data, and pass it to the iframe. And the iframe, being of the correct origin, could decode it. The same is true of you know, li some libraries that you get from third-party vendors. They might actually throw it in an iframe so they can decode that information. So it, but <coughs> it keeps the data safe in transit, basically. Now, if you look at the spec, if you look at the documentation, you could reasonably assume that fetch is no cores by default. Um, but the implementations these days are trending to be cores by default, and the spec is catching up. So you can say mode cores, but these days that is actually what you get automatically. Um, this is the second option parameter, and the one option here is the mode. <coughs> so this is what I just said about the opaque response. Um, actually, I guess, no, the statics is zero and OK is false. So it looks like it's bad. Uh, status text is empty. So I mean, it looks like there's nothing in here, but there really is. You have to pass it through and let the actual origin unpack it. Um, these, could be these can even be cached in the cache API and then read by something of the proper origin later. So I could have you try this opaque response in the browser, but you can play with this during the lab. Now, it's not just get. Um, fetch will do get by default, but you can set method to any HTTP verb, any method. So here we'll do a head request where we just want the headers off an object. And in the response, response.headers would be filled in. We could say call get grab the content length. So you can do head, post, put, you know, uh, options, anything you actually need to do, you can do. So here's a post. And we're just going to go ahead and put things on, you know, just add the data here. I could get a form, I could actually have a form, get the form data from it and post it. <coughs> I could attach custom headers. So create a headers object, add what I need, um, and set the headers. Or I could read the headers back, which you saw earlier, response headers, and then do a get. So here's a, here's a more full example of, using, of handling an image. 
We'll do a fetch for a, a cute kitten picture. Whoops. Pass that down the pipe to read responses blob, which will take the response, give you a, a binary object out. Then we'll turn that into something you can append to the DOM. So read responses blob takes the response in. By our pattern, if it's bad, throw the exception. Otherwise, unpack the blob. So now that's passed to the next thing in the chain. The next thing in the chain takes the blob, creates an image element, creates an object URL, sets the source to that URL, and returns this element. Remember that when you do document create element, it's not yet attached to the DOM. It's floating freely. But I now have an image node that I can go attach somewhere in the DOM. So nice, easy lab to get your morning started. Okay.